are you currently wearing an Oculus Rift? Do you wear an Oculus Rift when you're on the on the train? Yeah, I wear an Oculus Rift uh, wherever I go. I actually installed cameras on the front, and I can just uh, walk into doors and cars in the, in the middle of the street. Do you sleep with the Oculus Rift on? Of course. Who doesn't? It's like my pillow. I'm Cosmo Scharf, and I'm the founder of Virtual Reality Los Angeles and several other VR projects. And you're listening to the Drax Files Radio Hour with Joe Yardley. Hello there and welcome to the Drex Files Radio Hour with Joe Yardley. My name is Drexter Dupre. I'm here in our uh, humid and dingy uh, attic studio in Second Life's 1920s Berlin with the one and only Joe Yardley. Hello. Where's the virtual air conditioning if 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 you need one? In rich people's houses. Oh, wait, there's my gardener knocking on the door. I gotta just tell him uh, where to plant those um, apple trees. You don't have a garden in 1920s Berlin, Drex. Keep, right. Keep, keep, you keep confusing reality with virtual reality. Oh, there's a difference? <laughs> <clears throat> now, the station ID today is by Cosmo Scharf, who was at the Oculus Connect Joe in Hollywood this past weekend, and he will tell us all about Crescent Bay, the new goggly go 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 goggles that are the best ever, according to Oculus Senior Management. Uh, not just according, just according to them. Uh, oh. People who've been testing it are rather excited. Right, and even one uh, Ebbe Altberg has tweeted apparently that it's uh, somehow amazing to look through these goggles. Yeah. If you're not interested in, in VR hardware, I suppose you should stop listening right now and go outside and smell some flowers. Don't tell your listeners not to listen, Drax. I mean, I know I've had media training and things like that, but that's basics. I'm a socialist. I don't want success. Well, you're working on it. <laughs> okay. Now, but seriously, we have Widely Linden on today too, a senior producer at Linden Lab. He will tell us all about the soon-to-be-functioning official Oculus DK2 viewer. It's it's yes. working. They they're ironing out some bugs, and uh, it's, I think it's going to be uh, ready to download in a couple of weeks. So much more on the show in a few minutes. First, the uh, obligatory housekeeping notes. You can get in touch with us with uh, Avatar Drax files. He's always on. Uh, I mean, always in. On Skype, you can leave a voicemail anytime under Drax Files as well. Email us, radio at draxfiles.com. You can send us MP3 commentary, we'll play it, or you can send us music or whatever. You can support this show by either becoming a sponsor with your own banner or visiting the sponsors. Now, let me say this again. Frequent our sponsors. Go shopping, stimulate the economy, go in world, and tell them that we sent you. Capitalism. <laughs> We love it. And the only way we want to redistribute money, Joe, is by funneling yours. Sure. <laughs> Ping us if you like to advertise. You can also take out a voluntary subscription of only $100 Linden dollars per month. That's 20 Linden, uh, $25 Linden dollars per show. Also subscribe to the show on Stitcher, our official sponsor, or on iTunes. And uh, perhaps even rate or review us there if you like. Now, Joe, this is just in Marriott, the Marriott Hotel chain. Yes has built a teleporter and you know what it's not in 3d it's in 4d it's pretty crazy i mean if you if you watch this video it's basically a little booth uh where you put on oculus goggles and you're you know uh, you have nice um vacation destinations that you can visit but not only that the floor kind of rumbles they pipe in a uh, scent uh, of you know nice palm trees if you happen to be in hawaii uh, virtually speaking, they have a, a light that, that generates heat to simulate the sun while you're actually in that virtual environment. And that's the, the really exciting thing about how virtual reality is going at the moment. With every time that, that we're blown away by something, we know that this is just the beginning. That, you know, we are still in, in baby shoes. Uh, and, you know, this is soon what games and movies are going to be like all the time. You always with your games and movies. I want an interactive experience that I can shape myself. But I would step totally into one of those uh, Marriott built, uh, you know, semi holodeck teleporter things. They're actually coming to San Francisco in November. You can check out the website. We're moving on to the next topic. Linden Lab has managed to get the Oculus DK2 to work. Uh, you heard this straight from the CEO, right, Joe? Because he tweets everything. Yeah, he said it, uh, mentioned it on Twitter. He first he said that he tried a, a demo, which was impressive or awesome, as he said. 
awesome. Is that with a Swedish accent? It's very Swedish. Awesome. And then he said, uh, then someone else asked him if it's ready for uh, Second Life, if, D if Second Life is ready for DK2 already. And he said uh, that they're still fixing a few bugs, but they hope to have it done within a couple of weeks. And uh, the, the viewer will be ready in a couple of weeks. I spoke with Widely Linden uh, a couple of days ago. He's the team leader of that project. The Oculus integration proved to be challenging and uh, full of kind of surprises. And it really did take a full time focus on the part of, you know, the core group to keep things moving at a, a decent clip. I personally, and I know others too, marvel at actually, you know, despite some criticism that things don't move fast enough, I actually marvel at the fact that you guys are being thrown these uh, huge problems and actually come up with solutions fairly quickly uh, within a relatively small team, given the complexity of, of the tasks or given the, the complexity of stuff that you could work on. Let's put it this way. How how did the problems um, now with DK2, you know, did you guys think, hey, cool, we got it done? And then comes the next thing, the minute you're done. Yeah, it, follow, it followed on the heels pretty quick. I, I think all in all, it felt, it felt good to know that DK2 was coming right then because I think everyone who, who has experienced the, the original dev kit, the DK1, they, they, while interesting, you know, it is a somewhat compromised kind of experience, you know, you know, pretty limited resolution, limited amount of motion tracking. When we heard that the DK2 was coming along and, and, and so soon after, after we released, you know, our project viewer, uh, we were actually really excited because we're like, you know, we can probably start to, you know, realize the potential that we saw in the DK1. Now, when this thing comes in, how much work has to be done? What's the difference between DK1 and DK2 in terms of making it work for Second Life? Yeah, so a lot of the, the motion tracking stuff had to be uh, redone. You know, we were hoping it would be something that we could, we could get up and running pretty quickly, but, um, you know, it turned out to take a pretty serious effort. You know, a lot of the, the SDK stuff's just completely reworked. Um, the motion tracking, you know, it works differently this time around. What are some of the the differences of the DK2 to the DK1? Much higher resolution, uh, much lower latency. The refresh is, is clear. You don't get a lot of the smearing, image smearing and things like that. You know, it feels much more like you're a window, a clear view into the world. Your eye, my eye would sometimes struggle trying to resolve the actual pixel and the pixel uh, sub components uh, versus the actual image that the, pix the pixels are trying to paint. Uh, with the DK2, that conflict, your eye struggling to r resolve one or the other, uh, is, is uh, much reduced. The other thing is an increased fidelity and, and motion tracking. So the DK2 ha is uh, covered in little infrared lights, and these lights are picked up by the outboard camera, which looks kind of like a webcam. That positional tracking camera picks up and can track the, 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 where the headset is at in space from the, based on the position of those lights. And so we're able to you know, move forward, side to side, all those types of things and pick up translation as, you know, in addition to rotation. You got rotation on the DK1, you get it with the DK2 as well. And with the addition of positional tracking, you do have a, a much more increased sense of uh, presence and aware of uh, motion in the world. It's my understanding as, as a non-coder, it's sometimes difficult to, to even formulate uh, questions, but you had to rewrite everything. It wasn't a complete start over, but there were certain things we had to go in and touch up and take another whack at and, and kind of rework. I also, I'm not a coder either. I'm a, I'm a producer and I work with, uh, you know, my team of engineers and they could, of course, go into more detail on that. But I can tell you it was not a complete start over. Uh, we had, we were able to leverage a lot of the work with the hard work that our team had done on the previous version. It's a story that is happy in the end, but now you're opening a, a Pan not Pandora's box, but an interesting question because I'm so far removed of uh, sort of Silicon Valley um, job titles that I didn't even know that a senior producer is not sort of hand hands on coding in there. What what is what is the definition of a of a producer then in the 
in the tech context? That, that's a good question. Producer's title in, in tech and games, it varies from uh, place to place. But here at Linden Lab, a producer is basically a project owner. So they're coordinating, you know, the e efforts of engineers, designers, artists, and QA to help deliver a project according to the specification that they very often uh, draft or uh, build consensus around uh, within a certain time frame. So you also then define not only the time frame, but kind of how, I don't know, sophisticated or, or final the integration should be within that time frame, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so you, you, uh, you know, you work with various stakeholders to, you know, you have your idea of what you think an ideal uh, integration might be. And then you work with the various stakeholders to uh, see how well that ideal version aligns with reality. Hopefully, hopefully they match, but uh, sometimes they don't. Sometimes uh, reality is, is generous and you uh, can do a lot more than you had hoped. You know, and, and I think with the original Oculus integration that we did, we were able to go beyond um, a lot of what we thought we would be able to do initially. I thought the Oculus experience in Second Life was, was really mind-blowing in the sense that uh, when you have that identification with your avatar and then you look over the avatar's shoulder and the avatar raises a prim, you have this kind of godlike feeling. So I, I think for, for someone who is connected to, this, to Second Life in, in a community sense, in an identity sense, uh, the Oculus is a no-brainer. What would you say right now, is, is the Oculus a factor that immediately will mean growth for Second Life? Or if a new person comes in with the Oculus, is all of a sudden all the hurdles that Second Life presents to newbies, uh, are they going to be mitigated somehow or stay the same? Or maybe people will go even like, no, no way, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bother. I think for people who have, who happen to have an Oculus Rift, you know, and they, you know, happen to try Second Life, I think there is a possibility that they might be more likely to stick around because Second Life through the Oculus Rift is, is a one of a kind, incredibly compelling experience. You There's nothing else quite like it. But that is a quite a narrow subset, right? <laughs> you know, as far as affect, you know, the Oculus Rift implementation being able to affect the general, you know, kind of numbers or the cultures of Second Life as a whole, it may have a slightly uh, lesser impact. However, when you think about the type of the effect it's having, you know, in a broader sense to Second Life and virtual worlds in general, I think the impact of Oculus and Second Life is, is potentially great, could help very much, you know, to drive traffic and improve retention and all those things, you know, which I think is one of the reasons why we're so interested in supporting it even in its current uh, developer kit form, you know, because in a way the, this is the the best way to consume Second Life. But also I think, you know, as someone who has a deep investment in Second Life, Seeing it for the first time through the Rift gives you a connection to it that you, you, you didn't have before. I was wondering, um, because people always say, hey, wait a minute, David Roll from, in this case, David Roll from Control-Alt-Studio, he had a DK2 viewer ready to go. You know, people say, oh, the third-party viewer XYZ has this feature implemented faster. If you could illuminate a little bit the process within Linden Lab versus a third-party developer or an individual developer? What are the differences? Why does it take you guys longer? I think he got his kit before we got ours. <laughs> you know, one goal uh, with our Oculus Rift, because we're very serious in, in, uh, about supporting it in a meaningful way, is that we want to make sure that when we add support for it, we're not causing any th problems anywhere else. And we want every viewer that goes out the door eventually when the time is right to include Oculus Rift support so that the users of Oculus Rift will get the benefit of all the other thing, all the other developments that are happening within the Second Life team so that, you know, the Oculus Rift users aren't left off on an island, you know, and occasionally they get synced up with the rest of the the 
chain. So we're in the process of doing that now. And because that is the ultimate goal, you know, we have uh, certain QA procedures and things like that that um, are in place, and that just takes time. We're just trying to be thorough, take our time, do it right. It's just from the outside, sometimes it looks there's one person, and then there is a company of 200 plus people, or ho however many you are right now. Why can't they get it done when this one guy sort of does it sort of overnight? That's always the, the charge that's leveled at you guys. I understand the perception, you know, and we're, we're very proud of what he's been able to achieve. And we're proud of what we've been able to do. And, and we're uh, we've been we've been uh, talking with the third party devs and trying to help each other out with this uh, with this Oculus Rift stuff. Other people got some stuff out there quickly. And that's awesome. You know, uh, what, what can I really say? <laughs> it takes as long as it takes. That's that's what I say. But why does it take so long? We really want it to be good. That's part of it. I mean, you know, we're trying to get, you know, you find, oh, here's a bug here and there's a bug there and there's a bug on the Mac and let's fix that. Oh, we don't want to ship with that bug. We could ship with that bug and call it a known issue. You know, we're trying to, trying to put out quality thing. So now, in fact, uh, Oculus Connect just uh, wrapped up and they have released this, this new prototype, the Crescent Bay. Have you seen it? Do you have it? What's the plan uh, next with this one? Do you anticipate the same amount of rewriting of code or maybe less or more? It's really difficult to anticipate this. I would say uh, we have guys who have seen it and played with it. I, I have not. But uh, what I've been told is that, it, you know, it is a marked improvement, uh, a nice leap forward. Uh, if you think about it from the perspective of, you know, the differences between the DK1 to DK2 versus DK2 to Crescent, Crescent Bay, the difference is less in a lot of ways, it seems, at least from, that, from, from our perspective, from what we can tell. The latest two kits both use uh, external tracking, you know, versus no tracking at all, you know, in the DK1. So ideally, hopefully, uh, an integration uh, and support for that kit should come along pretty quickly. A final question. Do you already see an impact even in your private conversations about Second Life that this whole VR renaissance is putting Second Life back on the map? We'd like to think Second Life never really left the map, but uh, being the, the largest, most successful virtual world out there, we are excited to see some renewed interest and attention you know, from the press and things like that. Ebe has gone out and spoke with a lot of press, you know, our new CEO. He's the fourth person being mentioned at the upcoming Engadget Expand, as I can see on the website, as a speaker. That's pretty good. I think that speaks to kind of a renewed relevance, a renewed interest in the virtual, in the virtual world space in general. Um, because I think, you know, people who have tried the Oculus Rift and other virtual reality hardware, when they try it out, it becomes pretty clear pretty fast that a lot of the hardcore, super quick, twitchy game type experiences aren't going to work. And here's this ready-made, already up and running, ready to go, enormous virtual world with a thriving virtual economy and an impossibly creative base of users out there building this virtual world, making it bigger and more interesting all the time, ready to go for the Oculus Rift. That was Widely Linden, senior producer at Linden Lab. I also wanted to add that the team uh, at Linden focusing on, on Oculus varies, according to Widely, varies in, in size. Sometimes there's more, sometimes there's less. But our friend Void Pointer is the engineering lead, as he was with Oculus uh, DK1. Uh, Void Pointer, of course, is working on these things when he's not swarming with his family of virtual bats around some bar in 1920s Berlin. Yeah, you know, that also has to be done. You have so many celebrity visitors at your bar there oh you you have no idea and unfortunately i'm not allowed to say who half of them are in real life stephen fry I'm, i'm i'm not i'm not telling you all right but one of them is it was ben lang executive editor at the road to vr blog the most important uh, vr blog there is out there in 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 my uh, humble opinion uh and 
and even he was there and he kind of got the taste of SL, which was very interesting. He was a little critical, you know, very uh, measured. Which is good. But I think now that he tasted the absinthe... Um, absinthe makes the heart grow fonder. Speaking of Ebbe uh, Altberg, he is going to speak at Engadget Expand, which is a conference in uh, in November in, in, New, in New York. And he's number four in the list of speakers at that uh, kind of prestigious looking event about the future of technology. Linden Lab featured in, a, in an event about the future of technology. It's, it feels like 2006 all over again. Every time Second Life is mentioned anywhere these days, it reminds people that it's still around. Um, with pretty much any fact that we can get out there about how it's doing and, and uh, the economy that we've got and all the things that are possible in Second Life, the more people are going to realize that it is actually quite interesting again um, we hope that people realize that no matter what's wrong with second life and you know there's a lot let's let's not pretend it's paradise no matter what's going on in second life it is a fantastic amazing toy box and sandbox for for people who have who are interested in vr at this very moment i mean where else can you if you're brand new to vr but very enthusiastic build your own virtual reality surroundings within a couple of hours and share it online. Absolutely. That's to me the selling point. What you just said is if you're new to this thing, you don't know how to get started. Here you can start. You put blocks upon blocks, even prim based stuff. And you're there. Exactly. You can script and with all the shortcomings of LSL, you can start stuff right away. You know, we talk about this all the time and listeners might be tired of us talking about it, but the, the conundrum of, of our, our system where everything has to be new and shiny always, and especially, I guess, in Silicon Valley, and, you know, I'm, I don't live in that world, but, but it seems to be sort of the, with, with, with everything having to be new and shiny in order to sell it, Silicon Valley is even more sort of run by, by these kind of values. And I, I think in terms of SL, I mean, you have to turn the messaging around, obviously, by saying, you know, that our success is that we've been around longer than anything else and we, we are successful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it, it works. But since we're on that subject and we haven't we haven't talked about it the last few shows, you know, how what's what's the number one thing that you would change in terms of messaging? Let's say you were in charge of devising this big new marketing campaign and let's just say you have unlimited funds. <laughs> What would mm -hmm. you what would you do? What is the um, number one thing that has to be put up front and center about SL? Well, I think the most important thing about Second Life is that people out there realize that it is a, a, a place where regular people, normal people without uh, years of 3D virtual reality training, computer design, uh, game design, all that sort of thing can start creating that everything you see in Second Life was created by people like 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 you and me. And how social it is, and that that it, it is more than what the media uh, has been trying to tell us for the last couple of years. You know, it's it's more than virtual hanky panky. But now, about the people who are intimidated uh, when they see, you know, I can create it. People who are not drawn into stuff by that, but who want a nice experience, something that mm -hmm. uh, they just want to, for lack of a better word, consume a, 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 a nice polished experience. How about, how can you address these people? Well, I think by, by doing exactly the same. If you show, um, and, you know, and let's, let's be completely arrogant and big headed, uh, let's, let's, let's say you show 1920s Berlin uh, and you show that it's built by someone like me. Then you get two things. You, you show the people that someone is building this stuff, uh, you know, a regular uh, crazy lady in Amsterdam with no virtual reality experience whatsoever. Um, but you also show that there is a, a place that might be interesting for you to go and visit. At the end of the day, a lot of people want a curated experience. They want a polished experience, experience that's done. They come home from work. They don't want to go, oh my God, I don't want to put prims on top of each other and build something. I just want to go somewhere, uh, put my feet up and and, and, and enjoy what's, uh, what's uh, offered to me. Maybe I want a little action. Maybe I want exploration, but I want content to be fed to me rather than 
then making this content. It's totally fine. But how do you address these people? Second Life, uh, even though quite a few people will probably disagree, is interesting for everyone. I am convinced that there is something in Second Life for absolutely everyone. Even the people who've tried and said, this is not for me because, you know, I used to be one of those people. And no, now I'm addicted. Thank you very much. The secret is, is trying to show as much as possible. Throw it at the television like one of those uh, 1980s car salesmen. Um, here I am, crazy Eddie, and I've got that car, and I've got that car, and I've got that car, and this is how much it costs, but you have to come quick. You know, just, <laughs> just throw it all in, in those 30 seconds or 20 seconds, whatever it is these days. Um, go nuts. I've said it about the, the visual, you know, the, the regular advertisements that they put on, uh, the banners they put on the, on, banners, on the yeah. internet. So, yeah, instead of three people in, in, in bikinis, uh, why not show one person in a bikini, one in a medieval armor uh, uh, and uh, one as an astronaut. Throw it all in there. Look, we've got it. We've got everything. Hi, I'm Crazy Eddie. We got everything. That's a good one. Or maybe, maybe. We, got it. we got virtual. We got virtual 1920s Berlin. Virtual time travel. We got virtual hanky panky. We got shopping. We've got. You can be. You can look like Barbie. You can look like a crazy old woman. You can uh, build your own house. You can visit someone else's house. Go clubbing. Go dancing. Go go to a cabaret. Go blah 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 blah. blah. Uh, thank you very much. Awesome. You can have sci-fi role play. You can be harassed by Esteban Winsmore. That that is on one hand that is Second Life problem. Uh, Second Life's problem. That and they have greatest strength. Absolutely, because they have too much to offer. But the problem is uh, that regardless of if, if it's working or not, we also know that there's a very, very uh, low reten uh, retention rate. So the people who come to Second Life, uh, most of them don't stay very long. The welcome experience has to be rethought and then redesigned. Maybe we should do a, a special just on the new user experience. Talk to a new user, uh, talk to what people think of the new user experience and then uh, see if we can fix it for Linden Lab. Because, you know, for instance, um, this this little video that they've put on the new Second Life website, I'm not sure who made it. Oh, there's a new video? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's the one you made. Oh, yeah. That is exactly what I'm saying. Even though it's longer than 30 seconds, you pretty much threw everything you had at that video. Okay, but here's the criticism that I completely understand. Now, this shows people who enjoy the creative process. It doesn't show people who go in and just en en enjoy consuming that process. So yeah. the problem is this might put people off who just have that and fear of entering that you know it, there's a lot of people who are afraid of the blank canvas you you, yeah. you cannot reach certain people by throwing them a bunch of crayons and a blank canvas they're gonna run away screaming but you can make the same sort of advertisement with you know in the same style by showing people th the things they can do instead of build you know I instead of showing 10 people building things in second life you can show 10 people enjoying things in second life now people will say well uh uh, hasn't that been tried? And I would say, no, it has been tried only with machinima footage, but not with cutting in the real people behind the screen. And I think that's the defining thing. Exactly. And um, I still think that you have to start by showing that everything you see has been built by someone like uh, like us because you know that that makes to me that, that makes it very more, much more interesting so you start with a couple of seconds of a shot of someone building a nightclub and then it says if you build it they shall come or something like that oh my god you're on a roll that's good stuff yeah is that from the bible i i haven't read it lately <clears throat> it's from the field of dreams Oh, really? With Kevin Cost? <laughs> no, no way. <laughs> but it, 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 could, no way. It, it could also be uh, from Wayne's World 2. If you book them, they will come. <laughs> Set by the spirit of Jim Morrison. <laughs> Well, if it's, if it's Jim Morrison, I can accept it. But Kevin Costner, no way. I, I was convinced it was from the Bible. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. We'll link to that uh, scene from the movie. Okay, we got to move on. Okay, real quick, Facebook, because we mentioned uh, the uh, drag queen performer Sister Roma challenging Facebook's real name policy by, uh, by boycotting the service. Uh, and they're also very public about this. They held a press conference. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it seems now that Facebook has reinstated some profiles they have de they had deleted, but they're giving folks basically an ultimatum to to convert these two pages, uh, these these personal profiles to pages. I, as we discussed, I mean, I don't think this is a solution at all. Just want to mention real quick, I found a blog post that gives you tips on how to keep a pseudon pseudonym pro profile. Pretty pretty common sense type stuff, but still interesting. We'll link to that. 
really quickly, uh, because this is important, you know, because this is the flip side of, of all the powerful agency over identity in SL versus Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, the anonymity can can result in something that's happening uh, right now. An SL user had uh, threatened with, with a lawsuit against Linden Lab to deal with a griefer. Can you tell me more about what what happened here? Well, it's it's all from a, from a blog, so we don't we don't really have any names or inside information. It's a blog post and we don't know uh, all the facts about that. Someone got griefed and bullied and harassed and stalked and all those things and they did what they were supposed to. They reported to Linden Lab and Linden Lab said, well, you know, it's against our terms of service and it's, you know, reported uh, and write tickets and you know the same sort of thing they always say and nothing happened and then eventually this person who was being bullied did a little bit of googling and discovered that there is a cyber harassment and cyber bullying law uh, for social media uh, decided that second life is social media and uh, wrote a few impressive emails uh, in you know involving the law and lawyers and and things like that And then suddenly Linden Lab uh, did something about it and got rid of the degree for abandon, which, you know, it, it, it is a problem that happens. And of course, if you are the victim of bullying, uh, then it always takes too long and nothing uh, is being done. But if you're being accused of something while well, you haven't done it, suddenly Linden Lab seems to be too eager to ban you and because there's stories like that as well when people get banned for absolutely nothing. This is something that is very, very complicated because you can also obviously file a bogus abuse reports, um, get rid of a, a competitor even in, even in business. You know, and there is right now, and I want to actually throw this out to the listener. Please contact us if you want to talk and tape a conversation about the um, the DMCA issue uh, with mesh bodies. There's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, mesh bodies have been taken off marketplace. DMCA claims have been filed against other creators. And that's one of the uh, instances where I think that system is being abused. Um, to get rid of a competitor in a very competitive field of, uh, you know, of avatar skins and stuff like that. So, uh, but sorry, uh, carry on. I, I think that uh, Second Life is too small a company for us to expect them to actually deal with all these things uh, separately. And you would almost think maybe should, they should look into setting up some sort of, what you call it, impartial uh, group of uh, arbiters who can now look you're at... Now you're opening a can of worms because there was once the Justice League. Uh, oh, okay. oh and dear. This is really the interesting conundrum. I think if you outsource the, if you will, policing, mm -hmm. uh, you can get into all sorts of trouble, just like in the real world, because you have people who cling to power. And it's it's almost like I remember in high school, we, we had... Uh, mm -hmm. The whole monitors. Exactly. And some people, they love that. And they were, you know... Taken ad taken advantage quite a bit. I would have been so good at being evil, but you know, um, maybe I've just been lucky. But so far, to me, uh, muting someone and banning them from my land has always been more than enough. We got to move on to the next issue. Please uh, comment on the blog, or write us, or, or send us audio. Of what you think of this? Uh the policy and and the issue of cyberbullying. Uh, real quick before we get to the feature section, um, a really trippy use of augmented reality. The Imperial College of London has uh, put out a video and they found a way to map plan our surfaces in a, in a living room, in a kitchen with a camera really, really quickly. The system can sort of detect these planner surfaces, the non-planner surfaces and color codes them, composites them. And in no time, you have your entire living room basically mapped in 3D. And then you pop on the Oculus Rift and in that video, you see that basically then you see your living room as it, as it is normal, but then you can change the carpet You can change the wallpaper and then you can put your Facebook page on the wall and interact with it. You know, imagine in a couple of years when, um, you know, the headsets will be as, as heavy and clunky as normal glasses or even something you put in your eyes as, 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 as contact lenses. With a voice command, you'll be able to watch television on your wall. Ugh, you always with the passive television watching. Why not con Why not uh, just change your room into a room as it was in the 1920s? Oh, no, I, I'm, I'm scared of 
recreating. Right. And your room already looks like it's 1929. So Exactly. Yeah. A feature section, feature interview, Cosmo Scharf. We got to move on to my conversation. We got to, we have to, we love to move on to this conversation with Cosmo Scharf because Cosmo is a 19-year-old film student at USC in Los Angeles. He heads up VR LA. It's a monthly meetup of VR enthusiasts. Oh, excuse, excuse me. It's bi-monthly. I remember being 19 years old and a film student. You have to commiserate with Cosmo because the interesting thing you hear in this interview is that Cosmo is so into VR that he feels he's sort of film is sort of not really his medium anymore it's a super interesting conversation um he was at the oculus connect event and you know what joe linden lab ceo Ebbe alberg was caught on camera did you see this photo yep <laughs> it's a selfie of a guy with an oculus with googly eyes painted on it in the back is Ebbe. it's hilarious <laughs> <laughs> uh, back to the point here, Cosmo tried the new prototype Crescent Bay, but first here he is with uh, some uh, first impressions uh, of the conference. This is Cosmo. Oculus Connect was Oculus's first developers conference, kind of like WWDC is to Apple. They had a lot of different talks and presentations on specific aspects of VR Lots of, you know, obviously VR developers and enthusiasts and, you know, especially to get to see friends that I've met at other events there at the same time was pretty cool because they're all across the country and, you know, you don't often get to see everyone at the same time. One wonders if virtual reality one day will enable us to not uh, not to have to travel. Yeah, exactly. Interesting comparison. You compared it to to the Apple Developers Conference. Um, so obviously Oculus is is aware of their of, of, of their leading role within that within that whole movement. How many how many people approximately would you say were there? It was over the course of, of two days, right? At least when I talked to kind of the person who was in charge of putting it together, I think it was something like 800 people, between 700 and 800 people, I think was their capacity. I'm not really sure if that's accurate or not, but it, it, it probably felt like somewhere around that, you know. I make the comparison to WWDC. I mean, I've never been to one of those before, and I wish I have, but I felt like this is kind of Oculus's first, you know, big public way of coming out, you know, with a keynote, they, you know, that's certainly going to be a tradition that they'll carry on for many years, introducing new and better prototypes year after year. I mean, I think that's something that we can all expect now. Okay, so Crescent Bay, they're putting the pedal to the metal. Now they have a new thing coming out. Um, how was it? How is the Crescent Bay now um, comparing to, to the DK2? I'll start from DK1, actually. I tried DK1 about uh, a year and a half ago or so. It was pretty cool, pretty awesome, but it was very clear what the problems were. You know, motion blur, motion sickness, very, very low resolution. You can basically not see anything. You know, they fixed all those problems for the most part with DK2, and DK2 is very impressive, really awesome, very great positional tracking, uh, you know, just, a, just an awesome experience. And, you know, coming to try the newest Crescent Bay, Brendan, the CEO of Oculus on stage when he was talking about the prototype said it was as big a jump from DK1 to DK2 as it is DK2 to Crescent Bay. And I th was kind of not expecting that to be true, but I tried it out and the prototype that they had in those rooms, just knowing that those specs and those features are going to be in the hands of millions of people, hopefully within about a year or so, is incredibly exciting And I think it's a landmark achievement because they have, with all the little things that they improved in Crescent Bay, the 360-degree tracking, so you can stand up and you can sit down and it gets you perfectly. Uh, the high resolution, higher uh, refresh rate, I think it's like 90, 90 frames a second now. All those little things and probably a lot more you know, faster processors, they all add up to what I truly felt was presence. For, for the first time. And it really felt, you know, looking around the environments as if I was actually there. And they have, with this prototype, proven to me and to, I think, everyone that, that has tried it, that VR is not some sci-fi fantasy concept. The 360-degree 360, 360 tracking, so that applies to when you, when you sit 
and when you stand up and then when you sit down again and your vision just moves accordingly. I mean, at least when I tried it, and I know other people probably did not have as good of experience as I did, but at least when I tried it, the tracking was perfectly fluid from when I was standing up. I could, you know, crouch around and then I could even at one point in one of the demos, I was literally just sitting comfortably on the mat with the back of my arms out, you know, behind me. And yeah, it managed it managed to really capture where I was in the space. They still have a camera that an infrared camera that looks at all the LEDs on the on the headset and I know that it's definitely is an improved version. I'm not exactly sure how. When you're in the DK1, you can move your head like you can look around, like spin your head around, but when you push when you lean forward or when you lean side to side, etc., you walk around, it's not going to capture that motion. And so it really creates a really poor experience and makes you feel very sick when you move your head side to side and the image doesn't match up with what you expect. What other aspects do you know um, that they improved upon? I heard also, or I read, I read that it's a lot lighter. Well, first of all, they added integrated audio, which is a pretty big deal. So that, that is always going to be there. It's the, the, the headphones are, are, are attached for good. You, you can't remove them or, or what? No, they're removable. So you can use your own headphones. I'm not exactly sure precisely how it's going to work. They added built-in headphones to the headset. The actual design of it is significantly improved. It's not heavy at all. I mean, honestly, I just put it on and forgot it was there. And, and same with the audio. It's like everything came together and like I just forgot about the rift itself. Like I was just in the experiences. How about the cables? I mean, this is a, this is a broader question that I always think about because you've seen already a lot of other companies going wireless and stuff like that. Do, 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 you, do you foresee that, that the Oculus will ultimately also be wireless or there might be a vir wireless version? I mean, this, the, the Samsung collaboration is already wireless, I suppose. Maybe that's they outsourced that idea to Samsung. Well, first of all, the Crescent Bay prototype actually did have significantly improved wire management as well. They only had one wire going from the headset to the computer. And it wasn't, you know, as much, it was much more manageable, but, you know, it was still there and still something you had to be aware of. Uh, I think eventually the, the, the Rift itself will look much more similar to the Gear VR. I think the inevitable future of what Oculus is doing is mobile. Smart for them that they already have a mobile device, which is built by Samsung, but you know, it's definitely not as full-featured and, and not as good as you know the, the desktop version. Now, how about uh, real quick about the the demos that they had to offer there for the Crescent Bay? Um, what what kind of demos did they have? What what impressed you most? The the overall demo experience is very similar to the experience that Valve is working on, and I was fortunate enough to try that a f about a month ago or so. Oh, in the room? Yeah, the room. The room. Yeah. So they basically showed about maybe ten or twelve different non-interactive like experiences where it was just like a you were like placed into an environment and all you could do is like look around and like crowd and you know and change your position and that alone like not even having the interactivity that alone was extremely compelling the thing that really was was incredible was they had this one scene where it was like a dinosaur And the dinosaur, and first of all, like, I'm kind of like scared of dinosaurs in real life, so it was really terrifying. Well, let me assure you, there is no need unless you go to Universal Studios. Yeah, well, it was like coming down the hallway at me and like ran and like got up in my face. And I was like staring up at it. Like, I was literally like crouched on the floor, like screaming, like screaming in this demo room, like, oh no, this is terrifying. And I truly, you know, in that moment, I was looking up at the dinosaur and I'm like, wow this is VR, like, this is real. Like, they really did it with this dinosaur. They really convinced me. So that was, that was one of the experiences. Now there was, like, this, you're, like, on a planet, and there was, like, a, this little, like, blue alien creature that was, like, right in front of you that was, like, really had this sense of, like, presence that, like, it was, like, it felt like it was, like, this being, like, right in front of me. That was pretty crazy. Uh, another was, like, like a rooftop, uh, like, outdoor night like dystopian like building scene i don't know how to describe it it's it's really bizarre it's like i when i think back on these experiences you have actual memories as if you were there i have a memory of like 
of where I looked around in that world as opposed to just watching something on a screen. That's what's so powerful about it. So your projection about, you're, you're obviously very enthusiastic about virtual reality, as am I. And I have this interior monologue with, with myself with something, you know, everybody will have a device, whatever it is. Maybe it's going to be contact lens at some point or whatever it is. But people, but 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 virtual reality or, or just sort of um, being in a space that, that, that is irrespective of geography, you know, the holodeck and all that kind of stuff will become very, very um, commonplace in, within our lifetime. I'm convinced about that. A lot of other people are intensely scared of this. And I always, I ask every interview part of that same question. Basically, they conjure up the matrix where we all are uh, just passive uh, beings that are, that are sort of, you know, uh, floating in escapist fantasies. You're a lot younger than I am, probably half my age. So maybe your generation doesn't see it that way at all. But but w what is your encounter with this? Do you think about this? Do people sometimes tell you, hey, dude, why don't you go out and, you know, smell the smell the ocean or something rather than sitting at home? Uh, how do you deal with this stuff? Great question, because, you know, the, the fun the fun thing about being part of VR right now is it's also very philosophical, of course. And you can ask, you know, yourself questions about your, the nature of your own existence, the nature of your own reality. Once you have this device that is able to simulate another world and simulate it so perfectly, I think eventually, you know, we will come to a point where the technology will enable experiences that are indistinguishable from real life. And, you know, the, the point, you know, the, the prototype that I saw earlier a few days ago Prove that to me even more. But you're right in that I also have this kind of inner monologue with myself about, you know, the, the good and bad about VR. And the thing with technology, new technology is that it, it, it creates as many new problems as it solves, right? So VR has the potential to give us experiences that are, you know, unlike anything we've ever had before that are beautiful moments and can connect us in connect us to each other in ways that are simply impossible with a video call or with a phone call but at the same time you know there's there's a lot to be said for the potential negative result in that you know why would i why would i want to live my real life when i could be having so much fun in my virtual one and i think people have been Experiences, experiencing that already with video games for the past, you know, two, three, four decades. It's just like, well, what do I spend, what do I choose to spend my time on? And, you know, for the most part, from the vast majority of my own day, I spend my time on the computer or, you know, staring at my phone. So is it really so much worse if I am now replacing that time with using VR or something? Um, in the case of you, it's not because you're already lost like you pointed it out. No, I'm kidding. But you may want to read a book every once in a while. My grandfather, I always tell this story, my grandfather uh, said he doesn't want to be on the phone. He, he hates the phone and he actually didn't have a phone until 1983. That's a true story. My dad had to force him to put in a phone because he got older. My grandfather said, I want to talk to real people, not a piece of plastic. And it's the same that we have now in, because, you know, when I'm in Second Life, I say, you know, these are other real people. I talk to these other people. I'm having a conversation person to person. I'm not zoning out on something that doesn't exist. These are real people with real stories, with real problems. Totally. I think another, you know, potential negative side of VR that not a lot of people have been thinking because the content doesn't really exist yet. But just as a concept, I think VR is the most powerful brainwashing tool humans have ever created. Think about any medium we have, any way of, you know, disseminating information, whether it's a newspaper, a TV show, the internet, photos, videos, etc. Each one of those can be used to tell a story, to communicate with someone, but also to, you know, to push ideology, to allow a brand to connect with some kind of audience and convince them that they need that product or whatever it is. And now take those ideas and, and imagine them inside VR where everything, where all emotion and, and everything else is amplified. I think it could be, I remember an article once that was talking about theoretical virtual reality with, with Osama bin Laden coming back recruiting jihadists and uh, people laughed at that a little bit. But I do think, because to your point, 
when you look at it as a propaganda tool, you can push any type of ideology even more dangerous than uh, consumerist ideology, as, as dangerous, I think, as it is, uh, a political ideology, and convince people to be part of something big via a, a compelling experience. Yeah, I mean, no one really knows precisely uh, where or, you know, how that will manifest itself because the actual, you know, infrastructure, the software infrastructure is not built out in the slightest for making those experiences, but they will exist and they will happen. You have beheadings on YouTube right now. Uh, you could have an experience where you're the person, um, if that's, if that's your thing, behead other non-believers in any which way or uh, ideology you, you choose to associate yourself with and then you know, feel empowered by that. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of the internet times a million, where where little fringe groups and crazy ideologies thrive because people feel connected and feel feel that that is actually a lot bigger than it actually is. Oh boy, this whole VR, we got to stop it. <laughs> yeah, it's that's uh, no more VR. Yeah, exactly. I'm gonna I'm gonna create the uh, first um, no more VR LA. Uh, movement just real quick how how did you get start how did you get into uh, virtual reality i've been obsessed with technologies for as long as i can remember you know I, I read tech blogs constantly throughout the day every day but you know the rift happened to be on be on it one day but you studied film in college i just looked at well i am i'm still in school right now actually uh i'm at usc studying film production but i applied to transfer to interactive media because i realized that what i really want to do as a career and what kind of the rest of my life at least for the foreseeable foreseeable future is in vr this is great that you say that because if i were at your age i would find that if i had the choice uh between you know making sort of films which is a passive experience even 3d movies but and then creating experiences that are just truly interactive with the sense of being that's that's always more compelling yeah and the thing is like it's kind of it's, it's, it's a very interesting point where i am kind of in my life right now because i'm kind of caught between film and vr i mean right now i'm still in film but what I really want to be doing all day, every day, is is developing, you know, VRLA and my new company, my new startup, and not really having to deal with school. Are you twenty <laughs> four? No, I'm nineteen. Oh my God! See, buddy, you extra is describing the feeling when I was actually twenty three. School is kind of holding me back, even though I learned something. But I'm thinking like I'm actually further ahead. Is that kind of how you feel? Well, I was going to say that, you know, film, people have been figuring film out, figuring movies out for a hundred years. And most of the cinematic language has already been done. And, you know, you know, most stories have already been told in film, not to say that, you know, obviously there's, there's so much you can do in, in, in filmmaking and so much, you, so many different stories and kinds of films you can make. But the thing about VR is that 0.00001% of everything with, you know, to do with VR has been done already, which means that the vast, vast, vast majority of, you know, infrastructure, whether it's hardware, software, or the, you know, developing the community, developing websites around VR, all of that is, is yet to be done. And that's why I want to be exactly where i am right now which is at the heart of the vr community you are basically a uh, a european fella who gets a opportunity to come to america and 10 of his friends say no nah, i'd rather stick around here and you go like okay i'm going kind of i mean it is funny because in the past you know half a year my my friends that are for the most part all studying film right now they have you know watched watched me watched my interest in vr grow and i'm kind of known for you know being the guy that's obsessed with vr amongst you know my, my friends at usc and they're all you know of course you know they're interested in in the, you know they think it's kind of cool but you know they're still continuing with film and of course that makes sense because that's what they're interested in but yeah it's like i look at you know what you could do with vr and it just not even like 
a comparison. So that was Cosmo Scharf. Are you jealous of that guy or what gets to try all these toys and hobnob with the who who is who in VR and Joe, you and I are relegated to this decade old <laughs> virtual world. One of the interesting things is that when we started talking about the Oculus Rift, there were so many people complaining and moaning about um, how it would how it would never work because um, everyone was getting seasick. And, you know, you try and tell them that it's only a prototype and that this, it's early days and they go, no, 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 I don't believe it. And here we are with the new Oculus Rift and people are saying there is pretty much no seasickness at all. Uh, the archive panels, by the way, real quick uh, before I forget, is on the Oculus Twitch uh, channel, twitch.tv slash Oculus. You know, as they used to sing in the 1920s, uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. Oh, is that interesting? Was Kevin Costner in the 20s and said, if you, if I build it, they will come? He was, he was in uh, The Untouchables. Let's not talk about um, uh, passive consumption of uh, 2D uh, things. We are in a new world where it's all about us being in the experience and shaping it. The end of the show, Joe, uh, we're approaching the end. We are at the end, the end, my friend, Jim Morrison. Uh, this is the end. Any tips? I thought you hated hippies. Yeah, I do. Well, your parents forced you to listen to the doors, I suppose. You know, you can, good music comes from every era. <laughs> ah, interesting. You're growing. No, no, no. Even if the singers are awful, doesn't mean the song is. I'll let that one slide. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I want to bring uh, folks' uh, attention to a quick video I knocked out. Uh, avatars for net neutrality. I'm not going to explain. Uh, I'm not going to explain again what net neutrality is. Uh, but uh, my short little video is really kind of from the perspective of uh, SL users, and I thought it was uh, it was uh, time to do something like that. I also hope the uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation plays it on their big video screen they have across the street from the Federal Communications Commission. I'll link to it. Just watch it. It's good because I made it. <laughs> You're so <laughs> modest. I am. Uh, Joe, any tips uh, for the weekend? If not... Yeah, that's right. I don't go out at all. I'm stuck in Berlin all the time. But that's that's why we've got Siki Questi, who has a fantastic blog and who makes stunning pictures. And she's been to a place, I think it's called uh, Square Pegs in Round Holes. And it's uh, it's mostly a visually very, very pretty sim. Um, and I know how much of uh, people in Second Line love uh, photography, virtual photography, that is. And um, it's, it's well, to be very, very blunt, it's just a bunch of islands, but they are really, really pretty and interesting. And there's lots to explore and there are hidden places. I want to bring the attention also to Loki Elliott, who has redesigned the Vortex Club, which is a, a long-running music club in SL. It's mind-boggling, the redesign. It's straight out of Blade Runner. Uh, use of materials, everything that SL has to offer in 2014. Torley was al already there. Uh, I, I need to stream something on Twitch about that. The Vortex Club is amazing. I wish uh, journalists would take some snapshots there. Uh, also, oh, uh, Jesse Warhol sent me a press release earlier today. Uh, Earth Nirvana's Be Hunted group and the 2014 Making Strides Against Breast Cancer and Second Life Committee. They're announcing uh, a hunt. I feel you feel 100% of the proceeds go to Making Strides Against Breast Cancer. We're linking to the blog post. Go there and spend some uh, Linden dollars. We are going out today with uh, a movie trailer, audio only, because, uh, you know, we're on the radio, so there's no video. But this is a film that I'm actually excited about, speaking about passive consumption of pre-curated uh, Hollywood yeah, yeah, content. Yeah. Get on with it. This movie is called The Congress, coming out uh, very soon. It, it looks really interesting. An actress by the name of Robin Wright plays an actress uh, by the name of Robin Wright who sells her entire personality to a movie studio. They scan her body and soul, feelings and all, and then she goes off into some sort of virtual world and the movie studio owns her avatar for eternity. So. This is super interesting. It's about virtual reality. It's about licensing, about intellectual property. I mean, the trailer looks really interesting. I don't know what the movie's going to be like, but uh, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for listening. Goodbye, Joe. Uh, auf Wiedersehen. What situation are you in, Jeff? The situation of offering you the last contract that you'll ever have. We want to scan you. All of you, your body, your face, your emotions, your laughter, your tears. And we want to own this, this thing called Robin Wright. 
common. Things are changing quickly. We're entering the new age. Once we've scanned you, there's no going back. Welcome to the Futurist Congress. So you're here too, huh? You and I are the only ones who survived. Who are all the rest? Characters. They invented it. Are you Robin Wright? Yes. At least I used to be. What's on the other side? Truth. The Drax Files Radio Hour with Joe Yardley is a weekly production of Basic Drax Entertainment, a show supported by Leap Motion, SL Go By On Live, Stitcher, Paradise Lost in Second Life, Bot Girls Identity Circus, Carvel Design, Vicka Creations, Humanoid Animations, Escapades, Botanical, Death Row Designs, Angel Red Couture, Fallen Gods Incorporated, Blue Moon Enterprises, What's Next, Avacon, and Landscapes Unlimited. Contact the show via Skype, Draxfiles, Avatar Draxfiles, or email radio at draxfiles.com.